Joe presents Pioneers, together with Open Money. Financial advice for all. Hello and welcome to Pioneers. My guest this week is Julian Hearn, who founded the powdered food replacement system Huel, designed for busy, time-poor people a little over three years ago. Revenue reached 14.1 million in 2017 and expectations are for 220% rise in global turnover this year with the aim to create a billion pound business within the next four, ambitious to say the least. Julian believes Huel is the food of the future and we'll find out why. Uh, Julian and I, welcome, Julian. Thank you. Uh, Julian and I had a conversation just before we started, and you hate everything about what I just said just there, <laughs> almost. I'm not keen on the word replacement because it makes us sound like it's an inferior product. That, uh, you know, if you're having chicken one night, if you're the following night, you're going to have steak. This, you would never use the word replacement. You'd never call steak a replacement for chicken. Huel is food. Simple as that. It's food. We call it complete food because it contains all the vitamins, minerals, proteins, fats, carbs, everything in a single product. That's the only difference with it. And it does come in a powdered form, but bread is powdered, then it's baked, and people eat that. But they've never called bread a replacement for crisps. Your your objection is noted. I, I think, uh, you know, we were talking earlier, there's plenty of people who both love and are ready to critique your, your organisation. So let's have a chat about it afterwards. But let's start off easy. We, I've, we've been asking a lot of entrepreneurs um, uh, about whether their entrepreneurial spirit started early because we've met people who simply got fed up with the rat race at 30. Yep. Um, but for you, it's a little bit different, I think. I've I've done it both ways. I mean, I, I remember the first sort of business I ever had was when I was eight years old. I was, um, my mum said, I've got some spare plants uh, from the greenhouse. Do you want to sell them? So we made a little stool up, me and my uh, next door neighbour, a uh, guy was about a year or two years older than me, and we started selling the plants in the end. We sold nearly all of mum's plants out of the greenhouse. I think she came home and went mad because I'd sold the ones, not that she'd earmarked to be sold, but I sold also the ones she wanted to keep as well. You'd done a job just a little <laughs> too well. Yeah, but that was it. Then I didn't do anything else entrepreneurial, really, until I was 35. So there was a massive gap in between. I went the sort of corporate route and uh, worked for the likes of Tesco's and Starbucks and people like that and just worked for somebody else. I suppose it was just as simple as I didn't realise that I probably could do it. And it was the rat race eventually that just got on my nerves. I was doing, I was commuting into London an hour and a half each way. And that was three hours a, three hours a day. That's 15 hours a week. It's almost two extra days on your working week. And I just had enough of it. Mm -hmm. So I just thought I need to um, find a different way to do this. And luckily, I bumped into some guys who were running affiliate marketing um, get together and they were working from home. And I was thinking, hold on a minute, these guys are normal blokes like me. And uh, I thought, well, let's, let's have a go at this. So I spent the next year trying to work out how to how to make money online. So you, you said you started thinking about how you're going to make money online. And then yeah. you you went with your first company, promotionalcodes.org.uk. Not, not, not a URL that runs off the, <laughs> runs off the tongue, is it? Super sexy URL, yeah. But, but you, you, you thought of this idea of what, collating the promotional codes across the... Uh, well, no, what it was really, the, the, when I, I'd, I was working for a company in London and commuting, I had enough, and then um, I realised I wanted to work from home. So I didn't, like, jack my job. I thought that's the wrong way to do it. I wasn't sure I was going to make money. I was on a good salary. Mm -hmm. So uh, I spent the next year sort of learning the tricks of the trade of how to make a little bit of money online. So I was experimenting, trying different things. So I'd come in from work, have my dinner, then sit at the computer most evenings, doing stuff, reading, experimenting, trying stuff, doing it the weekends as well. And then after about a year of doing this, I started to say I could, I started making a little bit of money. And... Um, and I said to my wife, I said, look, I'm making some money, but it's not enough to cover uh, the mortgage. So we'd saved up some money. And I said, right, I've got six months. In this next six months, if I can make more than my salary, excellent. If I can't, I'll go back and get a real job. So I spent the next, so I jacked my job. Within three months, I was earning more salary than my salary was. So um, it just grew from thereafter. But it's quite a leap of faith, isn't it? To, to Even with your, you said you saved six months of money up. Yeah. Even with that, you know, exiting all, the workforce, trying something in your front room, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I built that business in my front room, yeah. So that that I first that was three-year business. The first two years was in my front room. So um, I turned over, I think, well, sorry, profit in the final year was about £2.5 million. And that was a team of, there was probably about four of us in the end, very small business really, but very high margin. And yeah, the leap of faith, in some ways it wasn't. I'd, I'd proved to myself I could do it. So that year before was the, the, the test and learn phase. Yeah. And 
during that year, I was making some money, not a, not a great deal, but I was making enough to say, I know how to do this now. I just need more time. Yeah. So that's that's when I just said, look, I'm going to do it. Jack the job. And I said, look, what's the worst that can happen? In six months' time, I'll go back and get a real job. I, I knew that I could go back and get a job because I had 10, 15 years' experience in marketing. So I knew I could go back and get a very decent job. And um, why not? Let's go for it. And I can work from home. But it's a leap of faith for your your wife as well as for you. And that's that having you hear a lot of entrepreneurs, they have great confidence in themselves. They know yeah. that they well, at least they have a sense that they can do it, but they yeah. don't always have partners who have a sense that they can do it too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th- she definitely uh, yeah worked with me on on that and said, okay, just just do it. She you know she she backed me up, and um, you know it 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 paid off. It's paid off for both of us. But if if it had failed, do you think you would have gone on to try and do other things, or would that? Would that have been it? I don't In fact, know. I mean, what, firstly, what would it have been like to go back to the nine to five? I don't know. I really don't know. I think that I'd like to think that I would have another go at it, but I think yeah, it can be pretty um, soul destroying. I think if you start something, I think as long as you bail on something quite quick and you haven't invested too much time, but imagine if you keep slugging away at something for a long time, that's really hard when it fails. But you know, my intention was is to not fail fast but my intention was to succeed fast but if I did fail I'd like to know quite quick it isn't going anywhere and then get out because I could go back and get a new job quite quickly I don't think that was a problem Mm -hmm. and so yeah I I was I was comfortable the way we were going to do it but what would have happened if it had failed I don't know well how did it feel when you knew it was really working when you suddenly realized uh I am never going back to a nine to five (laughs) I have a new kind of life what did that feel like I can remember especially for your wife because that 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 leap of faith for her as well yeah we 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 paid the mortgage off pretty quick that was you know that we never we never spent big we left a lot of money in the company you Mm -hmm. know we didn't actually spend big we paid the mortgage off but apart from that we never bought any sort of super flash cars or anything like that we just kept the money in the company and then when we sold the company we sold the whole lot and um but i remember the first time when the numbers got crazy i remember being down the down the pub with one of my mates and i said i I, basically i made 60 60 thousand pounds this month um, he goes, you are, and because you know, for most people, that's an annual salary, and that was profit in a in a month, and um, yeah, just it was unreal numbers. You sort of once you get over to we was talking about footballers earlier. Once um, to the other other guy, once you get to a certain number, yeah, whether you're earning sixty five k a month or seventy five k a month or eighty five, it's just it, unbelievable. It doesn't really, yeah. yeah, it sort of doesn't make a difference really. So um, yeah, sort of took it in in our stride, but we just you know. It was it was crazy in some ways when you look back, um, but at the same time, when you're in it, it's a sort of gradual thing. It's not like it's not like winning the lottery when you suddenly win money. Mm-hmm. It is a sort of gradual thing, progressive, and you yeah. get used to it as you go. Yeah. So, what were, what were the numbers like your your first second year? You said you sold it after three years. So, what, what were your numbers like? What was that growth like? Was, well, if zero to uh, first year must have been, uh, I don't know. 500k profit or something second year must have been one one and a half and the third year was 2.5 profit um so yeah big numbers and then we sold the company on that third year for a multiple of that to yeah. 2.5 so i got to a stage where i was i must have been 40 years old by this time and um i was just under 40 and didn't need to work again it's quite a strange place to be i had a young son at the time so i actually took a lot of time out took over a year out didn't really know what to do, um, but thought, you know, my wife was working hard looking after the, my, mm-hmm. my son, and I felt a bit uh, weird going and getting a job for somebody else. I didn't need a job, yep. didn't have another business to run because I'd sold that business. So I was in a little bit of like a no man's land, but we had a very good time. We bought a house and we spent a lot of time uh, away and had a really good uh, time. But then you, you think at the age of 40, 41, I can't retire. I need something to do. So that's why I got a little bit of itchy feet and started another company. Mm-hmm. So you, when you sold, what was your what was your response to that? Was there there are some people we talked to very different emotional attachments to their organisation? What was your no. feeling? No, 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 very certain no, no, no attachment to the company at all. So it was it was a money generating machine, but it wasn't something that I was proud of. That's why I've sort of started the business I have now because mm-hmm. um, when you when you run a company. 
the, the sole purpose of that one really was to make money. But now I don't need to make money. So now my purpose is different. Mm -hmm. So at the time it was, it was a strange, it was a strange feeling because we sold. I remember we signed the paperwork in London. I think we had one glass of champagne and went home. <laughs> got the train home at you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night. There was no sort of big celebration. And um, we didn't really do that much with the money. We put most of it into savings, into an investment house. Uh, we'd had one big expenditure where we bought a second house mm -hmm. um, that was you know, a great time. It was down on the coast and we had lots of friends coming to stay and stuff like that. It was really good. But we didn't really go crazy with the money because when we spoke to the investment house, we planned for to last the rest of our life, you know, yep. going back to footballers, you know, your career's over, what are you gonna do? He's got to last you the rest. We yep. never, you know, we thought, well, I'm never gonna get another job because that would be weird. And I wasn't planning to run another company. So we think this money's got to last the rest of our lives. So we planned, we invested the money and we lived off the interest. So, I mean, it's interesting. You weren't planning to run another company. So you didn't, you wouldn't consider yourself necessarily a serial entrepreneur no. at that stage. So how long was it before you started Body Hack? <sighs> Probably a year to 18 months. I'm sure if you asked my wife, she'd probably say it was sooner because she probably said he was always into something, you know, on the side. But for me, it felt like I wasn't doing anything for probably a, a year to 18 months after we sold. Mm -hmm. And then I started looking into something a little bit more heavy and started getting into it. And I sort of done a deal with her. I said, look, I'll, I'm not going to go back full time. I'm just going to do something two, three days a week. That was the plan. So I'd get a balance of uh, work life. Yeah. So body hack, I mean, this is... Uh, what was it? health and nutrition? What was that? Who was yeah. it? And was that your path into Huel? Exactly. Yeah. So the the idea of body hack was that uh, people obviously mo most people want to probably even lose weight or get a little bit fitter, and so you get advice. And oft often I sort of I know a little bit about it, and so when I when I see the advice, you think the the advice is quite often conflicting, wrong bad, uh, dangerous, there's all sorts of duff information out there, which is sort of frustrating. I thought, mm -hmm. well, I'm interested in this. Why? There must be a better solution. So my solution was we would actually test these things rather than somebody saying, do this, would actually put it, somebody through a program that says, right, we're going to measure every week their, their, their uh, dimensions. We take a photograph to prove it. We're going to put somebody through a vegan diet, put somebody through a paleo diet, put somebody through this high intensity workout, put somebody through this different type of workout. And we'd record it and, and then you could see which ones work and you go, right, that's, that's getting the results that I want. Mm -hmm. I'm going to buy that program. And, um, and that was the idea. So I was the guinea pig for one of the first ones. Oh, so when you're saying we put someone through this, that someone was me, you. Yeah. So we, <laughs> okay. did, we did four other people as well, but I, I did one of them. So I was working with a personal trainer in London. We got a nutritionist involved. They gave me a very strict, you eat this. Mm -hmm. It was a seven day sort of program, but uh, the uh, it got it. Uh, tiresome to do so I ended up making my life easier by just actually having the same thing every single day mm -hmm. and so I uh, 2,000 calories on a on a non-training day 2,002 on a training day three hours of exercise a week and after three months I'd gone down from 21% body fat down to 11% body fat and I wasn't exercising any more than I'd ever exercised before. I'd always done three hours a week. So it wasn't the exercise. It made it crystal clear to me that when people say, you know, six packs are made in the kitchen, they totally are. It's yeah. just what you eat. You can't really outwork a, a bad diet. If you're eating too much, you're going to have to do a lot of exercise to burn that off. So you just it. got to eat the right stuff uh, or the right amount of stuff. Yeah. So, um, But for contrast, though, because there will be people who listen, they think, uh, yeah, this was a bloke who was already doing amazing stuff before you started. What were you eating like before you started this? Um, I'm a normal bloke. I don't, it's just normal three meals a day and snacks and beer. You know, I cut beer out. That was one thing I had to do. So I had to cut beer out, but I was just a, a pretty normal guy that, you know, I'd got to the age of 40 without being uh, massively overweight. Some people leave school and put on weight straight away. I mean, some of the fittest guys when we was at school put on weight oh, yeah. a year after leaving school. Ask any ex athlete that they'll, <laughs> they'll tell you that that happens really quick. So it does happen, and uh, but I suppose I was quite well behaved. But I was just a normal guy. But, but I mean, you weren't a calorie counter. You no, weren't. No, you no, weren't no. somebody who was consciously no, thinking no, about the day. All the no, time. I was just normal. So the the <clears throat> yeah. So that. That, that was the age of 40 years old and I was like the leanest I'd ever been and felt the fittest I'd ever been in my life. So it re I realised that what you eat really is it's super important. So, of course, my friends wanted to replicate the results. And when I told them 
what I was doing, they go, how the hell am I going to do that? So, mm -hmm. for example, I was eating um, six meals a day, really. And so at 11 o'clock, which would be a really inconvenient time for a lot of people, yep. they had to, I was eating, say, an egg, a cooked egg and 100 grams of broccoli. So who's going to do that? And then at one o'clock, you've got to eat uh, 200 grams of turkey, uh, 100 grams of quinoa. 100 grams of baby spinach, some olive oil, stuff like that. So this is already too much. It's too yeah. much. People can't yeah. do it. It's too difficult to replicate. So that and that business got some initial traction. But the feedback was, this is too difficult. I, I can do the exercise. I, I can eat some of these meals, but I can't do this every day because I'm at work. Yeah. So it made me think, what what we need a simpler way. So the afternoon snack that I was having was a protein shake and a rice cake. And made me realise that the protein shake is super convenient, right? All you've got to do is put some water in, pour Add something water, in, shake, shake it, you're bang. Done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So made me think, well, that is the easiest thing. Why can't we put some of the other nutrients that you do need, your your, your fats and your carbs and your micronutrients and your fibre? Can't we put that all in? Because mm. you can't live off a protein shake. It is is not complete. So. Um, that is the genesis of fuel. That's where it all started. So I found a nutritionist, um, and uh, who's James Collier, who's our co-founder, and I just gave him the task and said, "Look, can we make a complete uh, protein shake effectively? Something where you can have all of the nutrients in a single product, add water, done." And he said, "Yeah, I think we can." So he spent a couple of weeks looking around, and he, he designed, um, put a formula together, which is pretty much the formula we have today for Huel. Really? Yeah. So when was the, well, sorry? When was oh, 2013, something like that? A long time ago. Yeah, it's remarkable. Um, and um, maybe 2000, just under 2014, something like that. So it was. Uh, that was great. So I, I could buy all the individual ingredients. I mixed them in my own kitchen and yeah, it was fine. So I, I thought this is, this has got some legs to it. And, um, so the, the next stage was to, to take it to the next stage, get it produced. And that's when things got really su super tricky. I didn't realize how slow, how painful the food industry is. It is super difficult to get something made. My background was websites. You can spin a website up in a day. Yep. You can come up with a brand name in a day. You can do a design in a day. But it took way over a year to actually get that product that I can make in my kitchen just by mixing the ingredients together, made it at a commercial scale. It was just really, really painful. It, was it was it regulatory stuff or no. was it simply the way that the the, the it's just the manufacturing industry just, works yeah I think in general they just don't want to know they they are factories and factories are used to just making the same thing and being very efficient and making the same thing over and over and over again if you say to them can you make something bespoke for me you know my order I think my first time order I wanted a place was two and a half thousand pounds it just didn't make people interested so I have to ring around and just like they're just they, sometimes they call you back, sometimes you speak to people. It was just really, really tricky. I had, eventually, I, I got this multinational company, this big company, and said, yeah, we'll do it for you, no problem at all. And I was like, you know, I thought I'm saved. We'd already been with nearly a year in at this point. And then these guys um, worked together for four months. We worked on a formula. We did some trial runs. Four months in, they said, we're not doing it. Don't want to do it. And they wouldn't even give me a straight answer, really, of why they didn't want to do it. And at that point, I was done. I didn't want to do it. I'd, I'd, I'd put so much in that I didn't want to do any more. I'd, I'd had enough. And uh, I can remember that day thinking, what, the, you know, what am I going to do? I can't jack it in now, but I'd, I've had enough. I just don't think this is ever going to go anywhere. So then the, um, the following day, I got out of bed and thought, no, nah, I'm going to get back on the phone, going to get back on the internet, I'm going to search. And actually went back to one of the people I'd spoke to previously uh, who's the manufacturer we use today, and uh, persuaded them to do it. And um, a couple of months later, we had a product, and uh, off we went. I mean, this this whole thing sounds, as people would listen, incredibly expensive. The idea that you've got a year talking yeah. to different people, trying to get people started on, even yeah. if they're small orders. Yep. How on earth do you get your investment in this? You said you were going to be really careful with your money. Yeah. You've got some other quirks about money that are really interesting. We'll talk about that. You're really careful. <clears throat> Where was your investment coming from? Well, luckily I'd sold a previous business. So if I hadn't done that, I would not have made it. So I would not have got through that year because it was just, there wasn't that much upfront cost. Actually, there was more money put through Body Hack, the actual previous company. I, I lost more money on that. That company lost money. I never made any money with that company, wow. really. Uh -huh. So that money uh, was already invested. But then I, I used um, 
used the the money when I'd sold the company. And how much how much was that you had to? In total, so I probably lost uh, over a hundred thousand on Body Hack, maybe a bit less. And in total, I put two hundred twenty thousand in total, including Body Hack money and that other money into Huel. But a lot of that was for early stock mm -hmm. once we'd started selling. So we were profitable pretty much straight away. But that two hundred twenty k was a total investment in the, in the product. You're watching Pioneers together with Open Money. I mean, a lot of people, if they'd lost money on a similar type of venture with Body Hack, they would yeah. have said, right, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to put this hard-earned money that we I squirreled know. away. Yeah. What was the decision-making behind that? You've, you've lost money on something, yeah. and then you're going to say, oh, no, no, but this idea is this better. Yeah, I think it was, uh, well, yeah, my wife wasn't keen because she had burnt some money. <laughs> uh -huh. So she wasn't keen, but I just think that, I just said, I said, I'm going to keep the cost as low as I can. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of the donkey work that was involved there was nobody involved really apart from you know uh third parties yep. before launch or even after launch so i just kept the cost as low as i can and i was just i just knew there was something there i just thought that you know the, the first company of body hack had proved to me that people wanted the results but it proved to me that it was too complicated this is this this is the simple solution this gives you everything you need in a single product how can it not be beneficial because all i in my head all i thought i need a thousand people all i've got to do is convince a thousand people across the country 64 65 million people in this country a thousand people just paying 45 pounds a month that's forty-five thousand pounds. This is a nice little lifestyle business. It's something mm -hmm. that I can get into, and something that I would be proud to do. It's beneficial to the, the planet. It's beneficial to animals. You know, it's beneficial in lots of ways. And so it felt like something that I wanted to do. And it wasn't going to be. How could I was using the product myself? So I know there's benefits there. Why? Why can I not convince a thousand people? And that would have been a big enough business for me. Yeah, when, I mean, when you put it that way, it, it puts it in perspective of the size of the potential market, I suppose, and the bit of it that you have to siphon yeah. off yeah yeah i mean you you said that there's a, a this this term i have to, the junk foodization of the high street is a big part of the problem we have i'm i'm a director of a, the country's largest nhs trust right we see a lot of challenges with yes. with obesity with yeah. those non-communicative diseases born of lifestyle yeah. uh, challenges yeah but is this really where you all came from that 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 idea that you could solve that because no. there's a lot of people i think would look at powdered food yep. as they might call it i know you don't yeah and say it isn't the same as as a as a food to them it's it's a it's for those people with the ripped muscles who go to the gym uh yeah the the powdered food i mean we do sell non-powdered food as well we have a bar and we have a cereal as mm -hmm. well the granola granola mm -hmm. correct and so powdered food yes has been used by probably two categories in the well three main categories in the past so babies Mm -hmm. um, so we, we give powdered food to babies for, I don't know, the last 20, 30 years. Yep. So, you know, that's our most delicate um, part of the population. So it, we know that it's not a bad product because babies use it. Uh, people who are slimming sometimes use powdered foods. And yeah, the people, gym goers or bodybuilders have used powdered foods. I mean, if you take bodybuilders as an example, these guys are the, probably the most hot on nutrition in, in the world. Yeah. You know, that's what they do. They have to be, their nutrition has to be bang on. And they've used powdered food for a very long time. And so this is when, when we when we first started Huel, I was thinking about how to position it, how to brand it. And I didn't really want to make it a weight loss product because that is sort of quite a tainted mm -hmm. category. And there's a lot of bullshit basically in that category that I don't agree with. Um, and I didn't want to appeal to bodybuilders because bodybuilders are already served with a sort of powdered food product. Um, and that's extremely competitive. Whereas, you know, bodybuilding is a niche market. I feel that Joe Public... Time is, poor Joe Public. Yeah, is a... they're the ones who don't really use powdered foods. They feel it's not for them. Mm -hmm. And actually, they're the ones who are missing out because everybody else is using it and getting benefits from a, a powdered food. The, the benefits of powdered food is you can combine all your ingredients into a single product and you add water and you're done. It's, it's so much faster. Whereas most people today will be using... For the breakfast, will be toast, which is basically powdered food, which has been baked and turned into bread. If you think about it that way, and it's, it's, got more, hungry now. <laughs> it's got more, it's got more, it's got more ingredients sometimes than what Huel has got in it, and it's more processed than what Huel is. Or you have cereal, something that was, you know, cornflakes or Weetabix that were 
developed a hundred years ago and haven't really moved with the times. They're not nutritious, really. They haven't got all the vitamins and minerals that Huel's got. Or for lunch, most people will have a sandwich, which again is made from powder, but is reconstituted into bread. It's it's quite it's quite a mindset shift that you have to get though it to is. get people because there no is. one thinks you're a weirdo. Even now, that you remember the mindset shift that had to happen with sushi, for example, which now a lot of people seem to yeah. to, to love. Yeah. Uh, to have that lunchtime, nobody looks at you crazy anymore. But yep. now, you know, going to one of the numerous numbers of high street places you can get a sandwich from, that is a normal thing or a salad from. Yep. But it's still, I think, for many people, the idea that at your desk, you're heading to your commissary and put, adding some water and then sitting there and okay. sipping away while somebody else is eating a sandwich. Yeah feels odd to people if it does feel like it's something that that's for a it's not for everybody fitness conscious yeah it's not for everybody but i mean we have everything from students to pensioners using Huel, and uh i think for some people when they use it first time they might not like it mm. they, they persevere a little bit like coffee the first time you had coffee until you work out which type of coffee you particularly like so i like coffee with cream or i like coffee with sugar or or um, in our latte or, or whatever your, your preference is with fuel it's the same sort of thing the first time you have it you may not like it but then once you've cracked it once you've got it with how you like it so for example I like mine with a little bit of coffee in and I have ice in it shake it up I have a bag at work and uh, have a shaker at work so I just literally go over get some water bring, come back to my desk put the fuel in shake it done easy peasy otherwise what I normally do is you have to go down two floors, go outside in the rain, go and queue up at a pret, spend five, six pounds, uh, and then walk back in the rain and go upstairs and then sit at your desk and open a packet up and then eat a sandwich. So for me, there's no comparison really. Once you get used to that different format, um, I think not everybody, but there's a large proportion of people that go, actually, this is a better solution. It's far more nutritious. It contains everything that you need in a single product. Um, and it's cost effective, I think. I'm so you, you mentioned you put some coffee in it. And so is there a challenge to making it taste like many people would want it to taste and whilst still keeping it healthy? Because I would imagine there's a sense that if you're drinking it, people want it to be sweeter. If you're drinking it, people want it to have some... Yeah pretty profound flavors that 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 make it pleasant yeah more like a milkshake than a yeah you c so okay two two things one is if you went to the best restaurant in the world if you took 100 people not everybody's going to like that food in that restaurant Agreed. food is very subjective mm -hmm. and even if you went to the best restaurant you're not ev not going to please everybody so food's very subjective and taste is very subjective sweetness is very subjective so for huel itself uh we do a vanilla a berry and a coffee and an unflavored version. We also do what we call flavor boost, so you can add some flavor on top. And we've got 10 flavors from matcha tea to pineapple and coconut to toffee to caramel, strawberry, those types of flavors. And um, yeah, it isn't the most delicious thing in the world, but that is that is intentional. We don't want it because unfortunately, I think if you make something delicious, super delicious, what happens? You, you over consume lots it. Of it. Okay, you over consume. That's the fundamental problem with most people's diet is not necessarily the types of food, it's the overconsumption of food. So it's, it's such a fascinating um, thought that though, making a food just delicious enough that people continue to buy it, but not so good that people will consume too much of it. Yeah. This is a little bit backwards to what most people see today. So if you go into a supermarket, nearly every single food in that supermarket is optimized for taste not for nutrition but the primary purpose of food is not taste no, it's, it's nutrition fuel. yeah it's nutrition and there's a specific range of nutrition that you do need so it makes no sense to me to optimize for taste but have really poor nutrition we are a nutrition first company mm -hmm. and then we try and make it taste good whereas most companies will go and make something taste good and then sort of go mm, yeah nutrition's okay and unless a law's brought out about taking sugar out of your soda drinks they don't change it they'll no, just that's true. they'll give I think people could listen to you and your, your talk about profit every year and, and investment now coming in and think that it's all been plain sailing. Uh, it's clearly not all been plain sailing. How have you handled some of the lows? You've mentioned them in previous businesses, but what about in this business? Uh, I mean... Uh, what, were the, what were the most profound lows? Um, I think that, that, that instance of when the guy said, no, we're not going to help you, that was a real bad one because that meant where I was but I nearly gave up. So that was really close to saying, like, I've had enough, I'm done. Um, and then 
I mean, all the time we do get uh, haters. Mm-hmm. Uh, on social media, we're, where we advertise and we appear quite a lot on, on um, social media, you know how um, vicious people can be on social media. And it's not the nice when you sort of uh, put effort into what you're doing and you think you're doing the right thing. Then when people criticise you, then that is very uh, hard to take because especially when they, you think they just don't have a point. So we are quite witty on social media. Mm-hmm. We don't take... We don't take shit from people on social media. Um, and if somebody's wrong, we'll tell them they're wrong. We're, we're different. We're not a corporate company in that respect. Yeah. And so we, we will engage with people, but we don't take shit from them. We will actually like argue with people and explain where they are wrong uh, and back that up. Um, but, yeah, it, it can be... It can be vicious. Yeah, I mean, especially I think some of the some of the critique that certainly I've read. There's a couple of Guardian articles. There's a yeah. Um, uh, I think a doctor from one of the London trusts mm. who who equated. You mentioned before that the phases of our lives where we use powdered food as baby, and one of the other ones is Complan, uh, yeah. the the, yeah, the, the the meal replacement for people who cannot eat, often yeah. chemotherapy, other other types. Yeah. And then the idea that that your food is incredibly processed is something that they that these articles at least have made. I mean, that's got to be hard to deal with in a in in Twitter sized answers. How yeah. do you how do you rebuff that? And indeed, you know, is that an engagement that you want to get into? Yeah, yeah. I I've I've had an engagement with a, a journalist saying you're just completely wrong. It's very frustrating. I think people look at a uh, publication such as the Times or the Telegraph and you think they are um it's the Telegraph's word or it's the Times' word, it's their opinion of your product. But what I've realised is not at all. What it is is an individual journalist who quite often has no idea about nutrition at all, isn't a food critic, doesn't know what they're talking about when it comes to food. They're just trying to write a piece which is sensational. And so it's very easy to pick on a product and, and criticise it and make fun of something um, when they don't really know what they're talking about. What, and, what about these? I mean, because I, I totally accept, don't you get online, <coughs> um, whether it's a journalist or anybody else, you, you often find people whose expertise is not matched by their linguistic ability. Yep. What about when you're talking to people like, I, I don't even know the name of the person who is from um, that London Trust who, who who went through and said, look, I've looked at some of the ingredients and they there's some dextralose, there's some high sugar, other things in there. And it's also highly technically manufactured nutrition yeah we will tell them they're wrong because it's not it's very low in sugar so it's not it's not highly processed it's very minimal process in here there's less there's less processing than making bread so that 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 might not be the for people who know bread that might not be the the best comparison i mean bread is is well it's highly highly i mean but everybody doctors are trying my doctor's trying to get me to stop eating bread (laughs) that's for sure but everybody eats bread really pretty much you know it's a staple a staple food and people eat it and they don't sort of criticize that as necessarily being highly processed but i mean fuel for example are six six ingredients plus a vitamin blend the 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 oats are taken from a field they're milled we've been doing for tens of thousands of years Mm -hmm. that's it you know, that is, that's the amount of processing that's involved, and it's, it's blended cl- together. So you've been uh, quoted as saying you think Huel can be the fu- food of the future. Yeah. Is that just a tagline? Is that just good marketing? Or do you actually believe that? I think there's definitely scope that as we grow from a population of 7 billion to 9 billion, we've got a problem. If we continue to eat the food we currently have, there's a, there's a big problem. So we do need to find different ways. Mm. You know, the, the majority of the Western world use meat as one of the primary sources of nutrition. Meat is incredibly inefficient. Yep. Uh, you have, disaster. Yeah, you have to you have to grow food mm-hmm. and give to an animal that most of it comes out of its back end and um, is wasted. So it's inefficient and um, very costly to the planet. I didn't realise when I first started Shaw, but more greenhouse gases are produced by livestock production than all the cars, planes, trains in the world combined, which is quite scary when you think about it. And so we need to be... We need to get nutrition a different way. We need to be more efficient. Mm-hmm. Um, and powdered food is a logical way to do that. Um, it is probably the oldest method of preserving food. As soon as you dry something, uh, you take away water. If there's no water, there's no bacteria. So mm-hmm. the shelf life goes from, you know, if you take a um, peas, we've got pea protein in ours. If you took a pea, a fresh pea, it's got, what, seven days, 14 days life. If you dry a pea, it's got a year, two year, three year life. So why wouldn't you do that? It makes perfect sense. 
uh, it's far more effective to transport because most food, 30% of food is thrown away. Mm. And most food is thrown away before it even reaches the supermarket because it's the wrong shape oh. or, it's the, or it's got yeah. bruised or it's the wrong size or something stupid like that. And so this just gets dumped. Whereas we don't care what shape or size it is because it's getting powdered. It's so getting... it doesn't matter what it looks like anyway. Exactly. If yeah. it's a weird shape, irrelevant. It doesn't matter. So the food is all utilised. There's a lot less food waste and it lasts a lot longer. So again, you'll throw a lot less away. So, something... so it's on a really pragmatic level, that's why you think you as a food, or at least that kind of powdered food is the, the food of the future. Just yeah. Because of the, the the greenhouse and other yes. elements, yeah, it's just a logical way. I mean, if fresh fruit is great, but you think most fresh fruit or fresh has got to be grown in either artificial conditions or it's got to be shipped a huge distance. Uh, even vegetables, a lot of it might not come from this country; might mm. come from other places. So I don't know a cucumber. I think it's grown down in Spain. It takes a huge amount of water to grow a cucumber. Then it's shipped up in chilled containers. It might get bruised or damaged. It might not be straight. It might be the wrong size. Gets thrown away. Then it goes to the supermarket. It might get damaged. Then it sits in your fridge and goes off in seven days. And a cucumber is ninety-seven percent water. So again, it's a huge, hugely inefficient. You sold upward of seventeen million meals in a relatively short period of time. It's a remarkably short period of time. Yeah. Did you envisage this? No. Definitely not. So what? So because you said at the beginning when we talked, it's like you just thought this would be a nice little learn, a little churn over. Yep. But now it's this. What, at what point did you say, right, this is now, let's think about 4 billion? Well, I think you said 17 million. I think by the time this goes out, it'll be 25 million. Wow. Okay. And um, yeah, so things are going very well. We're growing all of the time in terms of, you know, the crazy number that I said before, a billion. It's based on some pretty solid logic that we've, we're, the rate we're growing, um, we're going to do between 40 and 45 million pound turnover this year, which is our third full year of business. And um, for example, Fever Tree, which is a, a UK mm -hmm. brand that's doing very well, they took 10 years to get to 35 million revenue. And five years later, they were worth 4 billion. And their turnover, I think, is about 200 plus million this year. And they're worth 4 billion, which is a huge multiple, uh, a lot of money. Sounds crazy, but people eat food. People eat food every day. So it's a huge business. And you take the likes of Red Bull, which I've mentioned before. Red Bull is uh, tens of billions of pounds in terms of uh, value. And fundamentally, it's a stimulant. That's all it is. Uh, it's water and sugar and a stimulant in there. And uh, it doesn't give you any nutrition at all. Mm -hmm. Whereas fuel gives you all the nutrition in a single product. So why wouldn't a business that gives you all of that in a super convenient format be a bigger business than Red Bull? Mm -hmm. We always do this little pop quiz, um, which you will either love or hate. I like it. So here we go. Okay. Very quick, quick yep. answers, okay. top of your head. What other profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? I would probably want to be a personal trainer. I've I've worked with somebody before, and I really enjoyed seeing the um, the benefits somebody gets. All right, that's the least surprising answer you could have said. Uh, that's good. Which business or company, apart from your own, do you wish you'd founded? Well, I'm a marketing guy. I think the best marketing in the world is probably done by Nike, so I would say Nike. What's your favourite non-swear word? Huel. <sighs> I, I created it, <laughs> it's my business, so that's my favourite word. That is not, I'm sorry, you can't play Scrabble with that. <laughs> that is not a Scrabble word. Can we have a Scrabble word, please? Oh, dear. Favourite non-swear word. Oh, yes. 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 All right, all right. What's your least favourite word? Can't. Okay. This is a consistent theme amongst uh, entrepreneurs, I think. We could do a study on this. What's your biggest fault? And it can't be one of those, I'm in an interview, here's a fault that's actually oh, no, a, a I, I know exactly what my fault is. I, I've got no patience whatsoever. But I also see that as a strength. See? Um, all right. Uh, what's your idea of happiness? I think I'm a simple guy. I think just being down the pub with my friends. Uh, what keeps you awake at night? Nothing, really. I think the only thing I get nervous about or, or, or plays on my mind, if I've got to do a interview, mm -hmm. uh, public speaking is not my favourite. So if I have to do some sort of public speaking, I don't like it at all. Nobody noticed here. Um, 
What ah, this was one I enjoy. What's your favourite swear word? Fuck, definitely. It's the most expressive word. You can use it in so many different contexts. Ah, yes. And somehow it, it just it like a breath of fresh air. I know it shouldn't be. I just love it. Yeah. Um, anyway, if heaven exists, what would you like God to say when you arrive? Oh, I would like to, him to say something along the lines of uh, that was just the start. This is it's, it's starting now. You know, that was just a prelude to what's going to happen. Very cool. That's it for Pioneers. My thanks to Julian Hearn. Don't forget you can download the previous episodes of the show and all of Joe's audio offerings from your usual podcast providers. Leave us a review if you'd be so kind and we will speak to you next week. You've been watching Pioneers together with Open Money. Manage it, save it, invest it.